Hi, I'm Andrea Lipinski. And I'm Keith DeCandido. Wake the kitties, call the neighbors, wake the neighbors. We're back with a whole bunch of new episodes of The Chronic Rift. And to top it off, today we're coming to you live. <laughs> and in color. <laughs> From deep within the bowels of our studio, you can call us up and talk to us. The number will be on your screen, and you will be able to participate in tonight's roundtable discussion. That roundtable will be on science fiction and its role in using organized religion. Um, we'll be talking about whether it gets it right, whether it gets it wrong, how it uses it, why it uses it, and all sorts of other neat stuff. You can call during the discussion and contribute to it if you wish. We will also take viewer comments um, right before the roundtable starts. The number is 212-247-8090. Well, today is January 27th, the deadline for ballots to be turned in for our roundtable awards. Based, based on your votes, we have determined the nominees in these major categories. For the novel, the nominees are Barriar by Lois McMaster Bourgeau, Beauty by Sherry S. Tepper, Bone Dance by Emma Bull, The Summer Queen by Joan D. Vinge, Tam Lynn by Pamela Dean. For Best Comic Book, the nominees are Cerebus by Dave Sim and Gerhard, Mouse A Survivor's Tale 2 and Here My Troubles Began by Art Spiegelman, the Sandman by Neil Gaiman and about 6,000 different artists. Um, as one entry before Superman books, Superman, Action Comics, The Adventures of Superman, and Man of Steel. And finally, Yahoo! by Joe Sacco. For Best Movie, the nominees are The Addams Family, Beauty and the Beast, The Silence of the Lambs, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, and Terminator 2, Judgment Day. And finally, for the four biggies, best TV episode in the series, Darmok from Star Trek The Next Generation, Disaster from Star Trek The Next Generation, Fast Forward from The Flash, remember The Flash? Um, Laura Palma, Palma's Murder Revealed, <laughs> say that ten times fast, from Twin Peaks, and, this is a real weird one, the Star Trek 25th Anniversary Special on the Chronic Rift. Go figure. Rapture. Hey, somebody voted for it, so it got nominated. Well, a couple, it, anyway. Um, also, our inductee to the Hall of Fame is Gene Roddenberry. The Roundtable Award Ceremony will air April 13th on Manhattan Cable and April 24th on Paragon Cable. Um, recently, in Marvel Comics um, Alpha Flight, North Star came out. It was revealed that that North Star was gay. This is not that big a deal. If you were paying attention to Alpha Flight, you would have noticed that North Star was gay. However, Marvel is, of course, milking the publicity for far more than it is worth. And besides that, it's a minor character in a minor book. It's really silly to see all this talk of social conscience in comics and awareness of issues in comics when they're just doing it as a publicity stunt. There have been other gay characters in comics before. Um, Captain Maggie Sawyer in John Byrne's Superman, Arnold Roth in J.M. DeMattis' Captain America, Mystique and Destiny from the X-Men, the characters in the Freedom Force have had a lesbian relationship for quite some time, and almost every third character you see in the Sandman is gay. There were supporting characters in the recent Shades the Changing Man, plus, of course, the Pied Piper, who is also a hero, a former villain in The Flash. Of all the press and publicity that was surrounding this, only the New York Times and National Public Radio that I noticed actually acknowledged the Pied Piper. The most ridiculous is NBC calling this comics acknowledging an issue of the 90s. Folks, there were homosexuals in ancient Greece, okay? Um, also, it's demeaning to people like Howard Cruz and Alison Bechtel and the people who publish gay comics, which have been doing this for well over 15 years. Anyway, this week's comic in review is 20 New Dancers 20, Year 2, written and drawn by Mark Martin, published by Tundra Publishing Limited. T 20 New Dancers 20 is a strip that ran on page 20 of the Comics Buyer's Guide until very recently. It includes a whole bunch of spoofs on the comics industry, on life in general, or on anything else Martin feels like spoofing this week. Martin is famed for his Nat Rat parody strip, and sometimes he hits and sometimes he misses. His hits include convention parodies, especially The Adventures of Nick Conrad, Professional Con Attendee, the Cyclone Monkey Strips. He's such a smart boy, which reveals a heretofore unseen connection between Frank Miller and Jeff Darrow's Hard Boiled and Where's Waldo. And also his satirical, but not too terribly far off the mark, uh, series of Comics Buyer's Guide letter column debates on Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man No. 1. The misses in include Rescue 991, Dick Dirt, The Bat That Looks Like Gary Coleman, Pumpy's Day, The Christmas That Wasn't, and his own version of The Funnies page, all of which commit the sin of either not being funny or not staying funny long enough. Still, some of the satire is very biting, and if you like the, uh, an art that is sort of a cross between Ty Templeton style and Joe Matt style, you'll like the art too. 20 New Dancers 20 Year 2 is published by Tundra Publishing Limited 
40 pages an issue, $3.50 an issue, and is available at comic shops everywhere and directly by mail from the publisher. That's all I have to say about that. Back to you, Andrea. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. There were a lot of homosexuals in ancient Greece. Yeah. I mean, that's when being heterosexual is a weird thing, you know? Well, yeah, that's why it's really kind of silly to call it an issue of the 90s, you know? Well, they didn't say which 90s. <laughs> the 00 90s, right? Right. <gasps> BC. Anyway. And now, Jim Frankel takes a look at the latest in literary releases with this month's book notes. Hi, I'm Jim Frankel, and this month I have two books I'd like to recommend to readers who like terrific science fiction and fantasy. They're both hardcovers. The first book is called The Grail of Hearts by Susan Schwartz. This is a fantasy that combines several mythic strains in the person of Kundry, the woman who betrays Amfortas, the Fisher King. Not to be confused with the recent motion picture, rather the original figure from Arthur Arthurian Grail myth, weaving a powerful story of a woman who is at once betrayer and betrayed at the juncture of two mythic traditions, Arthurian and Christian myth, is no simple task and occasionally the narrative flags when the author seems to feel compelled to explain the strains of mythic fabric she is weaving together. But this is a complex, compelling story with a wonderfully sympathetic and conflicted woman as its center. In addition to the traditions already mentioned, there's also the background of the Crusades, colorful and, and just, just striking and strong, during which a good part of the action takes place. And Kundry is also identified with the figure of the wandering Jew, placed under a curse after mocking the crucifixion of Christ, his damned to eternal life. Kundry's plight, seducer, betrayer, and yet also not a willing betrayer, but rather one who is compelled by an evil magician, Klingthor, who would usurp the power and, and take the relics of Amfortus, makes this a poignant character whose trouble and plight and ultimate redemption imbue this fine novel with a sense of magic and power that is memorable. Susan Schwartz has written a number of good books before this. The Grail of Hearts is her first great book. Our second novel sounds like a fantasy when you hear the title, but it really is a terrific hard science fiction novel. There's always a sense of trepidation that accompanies the reading of a book that attempts to follow a novel that is acknowledged as a classic. Such a book is The Summer Queen by Joan D. Vinge, which is a sequel to The Snow Queen. The first book won the Hugo Award in 1981 and nearly copped the Nebula Award that year as well. It certainly put the author on the science fiction map. There have been many bad sequels to excellent science fiction novels, and we won't mention them here. But readers who have been awaiting this book for 12 years or so can rest easy. The Summer Queen is absolutely as good as its predecessor. It may even be better. The plot is hard to describe in conventional terms, but one can think of it as the attempt of, by a vast artificial intelligence network to keep itself from being destroyed by human greed. The designers of the network also designed mares, creatures who could act as protectors and maintenance workers for the mechanism. Only humans, having discovered the creature's blood would give them almost eternal life, almost get it wrong and destroy the whole planet, the mares, everything. When you combine this plot with the politics of interplanetary uh, politics, excuse me, politics of the interplanetary group to which TMAP belongs, you get a variety of factors, all of which are brought into this incredible 700-page epic. The ruler of Tiamat is a human, and she's also in love with a man who inadvertently brings the killers from another planet to Tiamat and who nearly destroy everything that has taken thousands of years to develop. Unfortunately, the man who brings them there is also in love with Moon, which makes things even more complicated. He's coming back with those who would rape the planet to keep them from destroying it and with it the woman he loves. There's lots more. Subplots on and off planet. There's a character, the smith, who carries with him the memories of a person who created this incredible network in the first place and whose help is absolutely essential to making it well after centuries of neglect and decay. There's also a lot of hard science fiction fueling the plot. What makes the immortality drug work is related to the stuff that makes the ship go super fast, both being a bioengineered smart matter. It's an interesting concept, and she makes it work very, very well. There are plots within plots, conspiracies, the mafia, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But what makes this such an extraordinary novel, a brilliantly choreographed future history, uh, is the seamlessly constructed world and a number of future societies, as well as the depth of characterization and the range of emotional colors demonstrated by a large cast of fascinating characters. Vindy is better a writer here than she was in The Snow Queen, and she pulls off a series of surprises and plot climaxes with precision and elan, bringing this novel to an exhausting but mightily satisfying conclusion. It's a very long book, but well worth the effort if you want a great science fiction epic. I'm Jim Frankel, reporting from New York.
Well, we don't seem to be overburdened with calls here, um, so we'll just jump right into the discussion. Um, fantasy, science fiction, and organized religion has always had a very peculiar relationship. Um, some writers just choose to ignore it altogether. However, others have tried to, for example, speculate on what the future of organized religion will hold. Um, whether it's Walter Miller's A Canticle for Leibowitz, Dan Simmons' Fall of Hyperion, Sherry Tepper's Grass, or others. Some writers like to just play around with it in other ways, speculating on what the past, present, or future will hold for religion. Others, their religious identity shapes the way the story will come out, whether it is the somewhat hardcore Christianity of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, or the Mormonism of Orson Scott Card, or even sometimes the Jewishness of Harlan Ellison. With me and Andrew to talk about fantasy, science fiction, and organized religion here on our live broadcast, on which you can call in. Just thought I'd get all that in there. Um, we have, on, my, on the far side over there, is Thomas M. Dish, author of The M.D., Camp Concentration, and a bunch of other FNSF novels, as well as plays, poems, operettas, dirty limericks, stuff like that. And on my left is James Morrow, author of Only Begotten Daughter, uh, which won a World Fantasy Award and was nominated for a Nebula Award. And he's written other stuff, too. Anyway, um, do you suppose this is sort of writing about organized religion is kind of beating a dead horse? I mean, hasn't the war between faith and reason been done already? <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think that that that, that uh, battle has been settled. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm often told, uh, Jim, uh, you know, leave it alone. Uh, <laughs> uh, nobody's all that interested in in your uh, your particular kind of agnosticism anymore. But uh, no, I, I mean, the, you know, religion's still out there. It's still making its claims, uh, and it still uh, makes me angry. Um, you know, like every time I read about uh, some parents who killed their kid, you know because God told them to withhold food or insulin or something, mm -hmm. uh, I gnash my teeth and say, no, you know, we just got to keep, got to keep wrestling with, with this issue. And, uh, you know, it's not a matter of attacking faith or trying to take belief away, but of, uh, you know, requiring believers to, to never, never be completely at peace with those claims because they are so extreme. And uh, I, I, myself can't live with them. I don't think that organized religion has good answers to the problem of why we suffer, why there's pain, why children get leukemia. Um, I, uh, I hope to never be at peace with that. Do you have anything to add to that? I don't think that uh, the best science fiction or the best fiction that deals with religion, whether organized or not, uh, is always in a stance of opposition. Um, it, it needn't even be interested in questions of faith. Religion is a social phenomenon as, as well as a doctrinal one. And some of the uh, best science fiction about it have talked about the church as a social institution, as the Canticle for Leibowitz does, in which um, church history of 2,000 years has recapitulated, ironically, in a post-apocalyptic age. I, am, I understand that uh, Mil Walter Miller was a believing Catholic, but one needn't be to enjoy his book. Uh, another example, away from our limited culture, is <laughs> Paul Park's uh, recent trilogy that begins with Soldiers of Paradise, which is a marvelous transformation of Hinduism and, and, and the culture of the Indian subcontinent. Um, he's lived there. It fascinated him. He's certainly not a believer in Hinduism, but he's somebody who is fascinated by it as a human drama. And it's the human drama of religion and the fact that religion deals with ultimately important and dramatic things that makes it a good subject for any kind of fiction. Yeah, I, I would hasten to say that I feel that I am, in fact, writing uh, Christian or Judeo-Christian, although that's, that's a, a awful mongrel sort of term, <laughs> uh, uh, fiction. You know, I mean, I, what I tried to do in Only Begotten Daughter was kind of reclaim uh, the, the heart of Christianity, you know, sort of the, the law of love, and, and show how when you turn that into a church, you can, in fact, invert that ideal, uh, as has happened historically. Um, but if, uh, what's going on thematically, and, and most of what I write is, is um, 
I, you know, sort of a, a ratification of what uh, you know I think Jesus stood for. I mean, it's very hard to tell because we don't have any uh, of his own uh, uh, writings or uh, laundry lists or anything. But uh, it, it's um, you know I, I've been struck that everybody asks me, um, have have you had rocks thrown through your window by fundamentalists? And kind of au contraire, the book has been embraced by a, a sort of liberal, adventuresome mm -hmm. uh, a species of Christianity, like you know, Episcopalian uh, uh, ministers and others interested in uh, sort of speculative theology. You know, so, and, and uh, so far, I haven't gotten any hate mail. You know, I suppose my, my life's not over yet. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> hmm. um, do, do you think um, something you had, you had brought into Only Begotten Daughter was that um, Jesus had no idea about Christianity and thought it was pretty silly? Um, did, 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 you, did you do that out of a mischievous sense, or did you really? Yeah, I, I think I think it, I think it is one of the one of the jokes uh, that Christianity has played on itself is that Jesus never used the word Christian. Right. He never said, you know, you will go forth and uh, form a church and uh, you know set yourselves apart as as an elect or any, any thing like that. Um, and he was always at odds with scribes and Pharisees. Yeah, I mean, when when I uh, I'm sort of the best uh, the, the hook I ever uh, God on the the, the gospels, particularly the, the synoptic gospels, is that Jesus is talking about a concept which he terms the kingdom or uh, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, which has nothing to do with religion or uh, an organized church or immortality or what's going to happen when you die or salvation. It's a kind of utopian, radical notion of, of transforming ourselves inwardly, spiritually, and uh, treating each other with a kind of radical morality, you know, which is where you get things like take all you have and give it to the poor, and if somebody asks for your tunic, give him his, give him your cloak as well. You know, this has nothing to do with what's going to happen when you die, and everything to do with a sort of utopia now, and and uh, you know the sort of guerrilla morality. And we have, we have a phone call. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes. Okay. Uh, great show, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, I have a question here for you guys. Uh, do you think that science fiction writers hate God? <laughs> well, we've got two of them here. Let's see. Um, what do you guys Tom, you want to go first? And see? I doubt it. Uh, <laughs> I love the. I love that question. I, <laughs> I can't think of one whom I know uh, who would say he does. Many would doubt his existence. Uh, and from a believer's point of view, that's tantamount to hating him, isn't it? Mm. Uh, but... Well, not necessarily. I'm just saying that... Well, you know, I've known believers of that Yeah, much. well, yeah. Uh, people ask me what my religion is uh, in connection with the MD, and I always say I'm a fervent ex-Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> By which I mean that... that uh, if you've been brought up in a religion, and it's been an important part of your um, childhood, mm -hmm. um, when your character is formed, when your soul is molded, uh, you will never stop thinking in those terms and finding um, the rhetoric and symbolism associated with Christianity significant and in, in a way thrilling. You'll always not just be arguing with it, um, it's, it's part of your artistic identity, inescapable. I, I suppose, uh, caller, where are we? <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. you are, uh, <laughs> there you are. Um, sort of hiding then, in, in that little box The, the, the first uh, question that the answer that pops to my mind is a question which is, well, which, which God, you know? Well, there's uh, only one God. What do, you, what do you mean by God? Uh, well, I suppose there's, uh, one God. there's only oh. one God? Yeah, well, as far as you all know. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? I, you know, I'm prepared to, like, hate the God of the book of Job, you know? I, I, right. I, I, you know, I, I, I think he has much to answer for. I don't have much use for that God. I think I probably hate the God of the story of Noah and the flood. You know, I certainly don't hate. I certainly don't hate God as I understand. You know, as sort of love. You know, God is love. I, I uh, I'm all for that God. But uh, you know, the ground keeps shifting. You know, and, and depending on how more anthropomorphic it 
guests, the more uncomfortable I am, because it seems to me uh, you, 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 you end up with a god who's been corrupted by power, and that's pretty much how that character in, well, in the Old Testament the is god, behaving. I don't think the god that we're talking about is corrupted by power. Well, it's sort of an impression you get sometimes from the Old Testament, sometimes. Um, the, 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 there are a lot of differences between the God in the Old Testament and the God in the New Testament. He seems kind of cavalier to me toward uh, uh, he, the suffering of his of his creatures. Often, you know, I think, uh, you know, if you like, go home and read Job. I don't think that that uh, response he makes to Job's pain is, is terribly satisfying or or loving. You know, uh, enough said. <laughs> Okay, well, when you yeah, asked sorry, about uh, whether science fiction writers as a class <laughs> mm, um, are minded that way, I think uh, one of the gods that, that has um, a large um, a large number of enemies among science fiction writers by looking at their work would be the god of Jimmy Swaggart. Uh, <laughs> there's um, fundamentalism. When people are casting around for uh, a, a future um, theocracy that's going to be the villain in a dystopian novel, uh, there have been a lot of them that, that have uh, been fundamentalist Protestants of that, yeah. of mm -hmm. that ilk. Uh, Gore Vidal did a book called Messiah, Margaret Atwood's The mm -hmm. Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. Um, they're everybody's favorite religious villain mm. because they look so ugly and they behave nasty. It's I mean, Elbert Gantry, I think. <laughs> I, I guess it's something of a, of a straw man, you know, but uh, let's not forget on Wings of Song, which for mine is, is, is one of the few novels that kind of makes good, I think, on, on irritation with, with fundamentalism, you know. I, uh, you should all read We've got another call here. This is amazing. Last time we did this, we got nothing. So. Well. Hello, you're on the air. Thank you. This is the risk you run with live shows, folks. Hello. Hello. Yeah. I'm enjoying the show. Is that somebody and, uh, I know personally? I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Morrow. He was talking about the book of uh, Job, and mm -hmm. I was wondering if he was familiar with Robert Heinlein's uh, Job, A Comedy of Justice, and what his uh, take was on that, and uh, just generally, you know, what Heinlein's uh, religious uh, perspective is. Um, I, I admire uh, his uh, comedy of justice, uh, Heinlein's book. Yeah, it's, uh, it's his sensibility on, on religion, at least, is very similar to my own. Not not so much uh, on, on politics, but uh, <laughs> I, I admire the way that Heinlein kind of gave religion a hard time throughout his career, as as, as I understand it. Um, yeah, and I th as I recall, near the end of. Uh, uh, Job, a comedy uh, of justice. Uh, you know, he ends up with what I think is, is is the best and the most fundamental critique of Christianity, which is kind of like, well, it really doesn't matter what kind of life you led as long as you you know kind of embrace Christ at the end. And and I, I get a sense Heinlein found that a pretty annoying uh, idea. Yeah. yeah. There were levels of deity at the end. He finds out that God is not really God. That God has a God, and uh, you know it just goes on. And God just. Uh, well, you have to understand that there's a difference between fiction and doctrine. Um, a science fiction writer can invent a different religion and a different religious belief with every novel, or several times in one novel. Um, Phil Dick has come up with a dozen. Yes. Um, so does Heinlein believe the religious mm, doctrine in a particular book? No, he's inventing it. Mm -hmm. He's saying, what if? He says, isn't this a good idea? Isn't this clever? That probably is what annoys religious, organized religious people more than mm -hmm. anything else. <laughs> the presumption of somebody else inventing alternate religions. Yeah, because it, it, it suggests, I guess, tacitly, well, maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe that, that accounts for uh, the religions that uh, that people, in fact, subscribe Somebody to. Somebody else know. invented them. You know, like, yeah. uh, you know, I, I remember people were, like, very upset when, when uh, Gilgamesh was translated and there was a flood story and, like, oh, my God, you know, it's possible to, to just make up something like a flood myth mm -hmm. out of your head and human imagination might, might account for, for religion. Mm -hmm. Gee, a sobering thought. Thanks a lot for your call. Hey, thank you. Next one. Yes. Get a life, guys. You're a grown man. Thank you. 
Um, anyway, live television. Um, well, one thing that I want to bring up, Tom, you brought up before symbolism, like Catholic symbolism, if you're brought up with it and it's sort of ingrained into you. Can't that limit you, though? I mean, I, I went to Catholic school for 12 years, so you could throw something out in a story or in conversation about Job and faith the size of a mustard seed, everybody would know what you're talking about. But isn't it possible that if you write something with specific Catholic image, imagery that you're losing a big part of the audience who might not come from that same background? That's true of any particular cultural reference point. Uh, mm. There are people who uh, make references to uh, contemporary politics. In uh, 20, 30, 40 years, those references will be requiring footnotes. Um, one of the main big arguments of our day is should there be um, a canon of uh, cultural information that everybody possesses mm -hmm. um, or is each little minority uh, its own cultural reference point um, I well, guess I believe in a large in the, in the culture sharing mm -hmm. Okay, we have to wrap it up. That's zipped on by. Uh, thank at least some of the callers for calling in. Um, and thanks to our guests for being with us today. Yes, thank you very much for the insightful okay. commentary. Um, we're sorry we could There were supposed to be two other guests on if you saw the flyers and they couldn't make it, unfortunately. But uh, these two were wonderful. Thank you so much. Next week, we're we'll be talking about Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. See you then. Good night. This episode was sponsored in part by Comics Interview, the magazine where both the fans and the pros turn to see who's who and how it's done. Recent issues include interviews with Neil Gaiman and Dave Sim. Plus, Comics Interview number 100 features a list of the 100 most powerful people in the comics industry. For a free catalog, write to Comics Interview, 234 Fifth Avenue, Suite 301, New York, New York, 1001. The Omega Zone, a store specializing in comic books and video movie rentals, including science fiction, horror, animation, and cult films you won't find at your local video store. Now in a new location, 258 West 15th Street between 7th and 8th Avenues in Manhattan. Telephone, 212-645-6941. Icon 11, the East Coast's largest fantasy, science fiction, and comics convention to be held April 3rd through the 5th at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, Long Island. Guests include Tor Brooks publisher Tom Doherty, authors Mike Resnick, Philip Jose Farmer, Walter John Williams, and Joan D. Vigi, the staff of the Chronic Rift, and many more. For more information, write to Icon, P.O. Box 550, Stony Brook, New York, 11790. Daw Books, publishers of fantasy, science fiction, and horror since 1971. For a free catalog, write to Daw Books Incorporated, 375 Hudson Street, Department T, New York, New York, 10014.